Well, good morning and happy Lord's Day to you. And we want to thank you so much for joining our live stream this morning. We just finished up a sweet time of fellowship outdoors with our second week of outdoor services. And we are now just starting a sweet time of fellowship indoors. We have some um, folks in the auditorium spread out. And um, so we welcome you via live stream and we welcome everyone in the auditorium as well to our morning service this week. And uh, if you are visiting with us via live stream and you'd like to get a hold of us, you can do so via email at church at bethedon.org. And you can just shoot an email over via that revenue and we'll try to get back to you and we'll try to get to know you and we'd love to meet you in person as things are opening up throughout the next couple of months. Uh, last week we sang uh, hymns about Christ's sacrificial atonement on the cross and this week we'll begin with a hymn that focuses on the love of God that started that work on the cross. And we'll sing about how deep the Father's love for us, we who are rebels, we who are sinners, we who cause the death of his Son, but he graciously gives us his love and salvation in Christ. Let's sing together how deep the Father's love for us. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. We'll continue in that strain of thought with the question, Died he for me, the one who caused his pain? And our only response is, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? And we'll sing all four verses of that familiar hymn, And Can It Be? And can it be that I should gain an interest in the same?
Well, good morning, everybody. It's, it's good to see you. Hey, that is, that feels really good. After three months of not hearing uh, much of anything in the auditorium, except for those of us that are participating, teasing one another when we weren't on screen, uh, it is so good to hear, hear a hearty good morning. So it's good to see you. It's good to see those of you that are watching today. Uh, via our live stream. I want to let everybody know that we are planning on continuing with the same kind of three-service format uh, for the remainder of June. So today's the 14th. On the 24th, 21st, next Sunday, and the 28th, uh, we will plan on a 9 o'clock outdoor service and a 10.30 in the auditorium service where we can have up to 50 people, um, and then we will live stream that service. And then for those that are at home, you simply just don't feel like you're quite ready to regather with us or maybe unable to do that, uh, we want you to know that we are planning on continuing the live stream indefinitely. Uh, we have heard for years that that would be a wonderful blessing to the folks that are in a, a nursing home or shut in and simply just can't get out. Um, and for those when there's inclement weather who are unable to join us. And so we will continue with that live stream. Uh, it is our uh, a new month with our First Things First uh, theme for the, for the calendar year. Uh, back in February, we introduced a theme for our church family, and uh, that theme is First Things First with the goal of trying to put our best effort into what's most important and uh, to be best at what's most important. And so we have five emphases throughout the year, and this month and next month, our emphasis is partnering even better. And by that, we are referring to partnering with with our missionary partners, the church family support over 40 missionaries, and so during the month of during the month of uh, June and July, we are encouraging our church family to read a book entitled Missions by Andy Johnson. And uh, that was a book that Pastor Don has recommended to us and I know will be a help and encouragement to you. It kind of pulls together so many of the components of our church's philosophy of missions. And um, we're not actually selling those when you're here, but if you'd like one, we can send one with you today. We have five or six copies left. Or we can order one for, for you and we can just arrange payment, however works best. Uh, for those that are watching on the live stream, if you would like to get one of those books, uh, we would be glad to send it to you in the mail, and again, you can, we can just take care of payment whenever. 
But our uh, first things first verses for the month of June are familiar verses to us. The Great Commission is recorded in Matthew, uh, but maybe verses that we've never, never memorized before. And so we're going to say those verses. We'll do it like we normally do, reference, verse, reference. And this morning we'll go through it only one time. So everybody reading together, it'll be on your screen at home or on the screens here in the auditorium. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 18-20. Well, this Sunday is a very exciting Sunday for our church family. Uh, back a few weeks ago, we voted as a church uh, to fund uh, some year-round internships. We, want, we are recognizing that uh, there are churches all around the country and around the world uh, that are having a very difficult time finding pastors and assistant pastors. And with uh, all of the experience and resources that God has blessed us with here at Beth Eden, with a dear church family uh, that is patient, kind, and loving, uh, we want to be a part of the solution. And so uh, we funded uh, a, some, some year-round or two-year internships, and our first intern is here. Uh, he and his wife arrived this past week, and we want to introduce them to you. So I'm going to ask Daniel and Lene Vanderhart to come and share their testimony, and then we'll give them a few things, pray for them, and continue on with our service. Well, good morning. It's nice to be here. Uh, it's been a process to get here, uh, but just a quick introduction about ourselves. Uh, we want to give our salvation testimonies and just a little bit of what the Lord's been doing in our lives the last two years. Uh, so Lene's going to go first. I'm excited to be back at Beth Eden. Um, this was my home church from fourth grade to about two years ago when we got married. Um, my salvation testimony starts when I was about four or five. Um, my mom uh, told me and explained to me what Jesus did for me on the cross um, and asked if I wanted to get saved. So I did, and I held on to that date as the day I got saved for quite a while. Um, I got baptized here at Beth Eden when I was about eight. And then um, at camp one, um, one summer, during a sermon when I was about 12 years old, God laid it on my heart that I needed to gain assurance of my salvation. I'd been doubting for a long time and not really sure if um, when I was younger if I actually did get saved, if I understood what was going on. Um, and so I gained assurance that night at camp. Um, so after that, I had no more doubts. I knew for sure that I was saved, but I couldn't pinpoint when during that time between 4 and 12 when I actually got saved. Um, so the question popped up, was I baptized before I was saved? Um, I pushed that question aside for quite a while, not really wanting to deal with it. Um, not really wanting to get baptized again, um, but then the question came back up uh, when we were becoming members at our church in Wisconsin, and so a year ago in March, I was baptized again here at Beth Eden, which was neat. So my salvation testimony, uh, when I was four or five years old, uh, on a Wednesday night, I believe, uh, my sister and I were talking in bed. And I'm not sure if it was the convicting voice of the Holy Spirit or my sisters. Uh, I couldn't really tell them apart at that time. Uh, but I, I started breaking down and crying not uh, because of the conviction. And we were talking about heaven and hell and salvation. Um, and I was crying, and my mom walked by at that point and said, Daniel, what's going on? Why are you crying? And I said, I want to get saved. And so my mom um, sent me down to the office where my dad was studying. And uh, so I went down to talk with him, and he walked me through the Romans Road and explained to me the gospel of salvation and that there was nothing in me that could save myself. There's no good works I could do. There was nothing I could earn or merit, um, and that it was all of Christ that could save me. And so that night, I believe I turned my life over to the Lord. He saved me, and uh, I've been growing ever since. And uh, so then just for the last couple of years, uh, both of us attended Maranatha Baptist University, and 
Uh, the first day we met, if you want an interesting story, you can catch us after the service and we'll tell you about uh, the first day we met and she changed my flat tire. So if you want more on that, talk to us. Uh, so a couple years later we started dating and then a couple years later we got married here at Beth Eden. And so Pastor Jason, he did all the, the, the marriage counseling and the wedding ceremony. And so if there's any problems in our relationship, we can look at Pastor Jason and said he's the guy, he's the reason for us. Um, and so then the last two years, I've been in seminary uh, studying uh, just biblical studies, more Bible. And Lene was teaching at Academy of Excellence in Milwaukee. Uh, and so then at Christmas time, Pastor Jason um, contacted us and mentioned this opportunity of a two-year internship. And... Um, we were interested and we were working together trying to figure this out and then the whole COVID lockdown happened and about the time you were going to vote on having us out here uh, that lockdown happened and we were now in this kind of weird position are we coming out here or are we not and so we're excited to be here and I can just say so clearly that the Lord has led us here uh, before we came I made a list of probably 10 specific things that I saw the Lord working in our lives um, to get us to this point. And it's been you know, a long process for those last six months. Um, but I do want to say that the actual road out here, the journey to get here, uh, we could see the Lord at, at work. Uh, it's a 16-hour drive, and uh, we were just thinking of pounding it out, driving through the night. Um, but about 8 or 9 o'clock, we got tired, and we stopped at Kearney, Nebraska, and got a hotel and, and spent the night there and get refreshed and le left in the morning. But when we got on the road in the morning, and we're driving this U-Haul, and the winds are, have picked up, and the signs on the side of the road said, beware, 65 mile an hour uh, gust of winds. And so this wind was blowing us all over the road, and so we pulled off about an hour later at a McDonald's gas station, and we were talking to some people there, and they said, that seven tornadoes had gone through the area we were supposed to drive through that night. Uh, so the Lord just protected us on the road out here, uh, just made us tired, pulled over. Uh, but we pounded it out the rest of the way, and the Lord um, gave us a safe travel out here. So we are excited to spend the next two years here ministering and serving alongside you guys. As I said before, we are so glad to have Dan and Lene here. Uh, for those that are watching the live stream, there was a subtle joke in what Lene said or Daniel said about their first, how they met uh, with Lene fixing Daniel's tire. Uh, most of our church family knows that Lene's father is a fantastic auto mechanic. And I don't know that Jim was ever more proud <laughs> than when he discovered that his uh, daughter met her future husband by changing his tire. So uh, we want to present them with a few things. And uh, normally you give a gift to someone and then you ask them to open it. But I'm going to open the gift and then give it to you. So, Lene, maybe you can hold these for us. Um, we, as we mentioned, are in the midst of a first things first emphasis. And uh, so this year we're reading five books together. And you'll have to get caught up a little bit because we've already read two of these books and then we're starting a new set of books. And so those are for you guys. And then we want you to be able to get to know our church family and quickly. And so we'll give you each a copy of our church directory. And uh, we challenge our church family uh, to pray through the church directory, maybe a few people a day or even a column a day. And uh, that's the best way to get to know each other and even to fulfill our covenant responsibilities to one another. And then finally, uh, I did your premarital counseling. I did counsel you to uh, spend, prioritize time together, and you're about to get really busy. And uh, so this is for a date night. I don't know if you can see on the screen. This is a Bojo's gift card. Bojo's is distinctly Colorado pizza. I know you know all about Bojo's. Uh, but when you have some time, uh, if you don't have time, uh, let the pastor know, and uh, or maybe better yet, let the pastor's wife know, and uh, we will make sure that you have the time that you need uh, to be able to go and, and enjoy some time together. So why don't we pray for them? You can kind of huddle in here, and I'll pray for you. Father, we are so excited for this uh, time with having Daniel and Lene here. Uh, they have said that they could see evidences of your clear leading over the last few months here, and 
Uh, we've seen the evidence of that uh, from our side as well. Uh, we know that uh, you have promised in Ephesians 4 to provide leaders for your church, but that the way that you do that is through raising them up through the church. And uh, we are aware of the needs of churches uh, in the Denver area, Colorado, United States, and around the world. And, and we want to be a part, uh, Father, of, of uh, seeing leaders raised up. And we're thankful for that good work, saving work, uh, calling work that you've already done in Daniel and Lene. Lord, I pray that their time here would be sweet. I pray that we as a church family would appreciate the, the weight of privilege and responsibility, uh, that we'd steward that faithfully, that we'd come alongside them and pray for them and encourage them and give them opportunities. And I pray that their ministry to us would be full and rich and joyful and that we'd all be able to look back a couple years from now and uh, rejoice in what you have done during this time. Uh, thank you again for allowing them to get here safely. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, you guys. You can take that and have a seat. We have been, uh, during this uh, coronavirus uh, quarantine time, we've been doing fellowship, in, uh, fellowship time in a little bit different way. Um, and that is we've encouraged everybody to text and call one another uh, while we play a few minutes of uh, music on our live stream. And so we are going to, we, we heard back even from some of the live stream folks, please don't discontinue that. Uh, and so we are going to, we're going to do that now. Grab your phone, grab your church directory, and uh, you can call or text someone during this time. A couple weeks ago, we began reading through Psalm 55 as part of our scripture reading in the service. And we're going to actually continue that today, uh, reading the last half of Psalm 55 together. 
I don't know if you'll remember this, but a couple weeks ago we talked about the circumstances surrounding Psalm 55. We don't know what the specific circumstances are, but we do know that it's a psalm of betrayal. David, the author of the psalm, has felt some sort of betrayal by someone who is close to him. And that's, a, that's an experience we've all had. And as we read the beginning of the psalm, we, we got to sense how David was feeling about that betrayal. Now, as we read the last half of the psalm, we'll be seeing what David is going to do with that betrayal. As I mentioned the last time we read through this, it's interesting to me that we don't know the specific story in David's life that prompted this psalm. And I think that's a grace of God because we get to read our betrayals into David's betrayal. His response, what he does with it, is something we can do with it, whether or not our actual experience is the same as David's because we don't know what David's experience was. We just know he was betrayed. And so when you and I feel betrayed, this is a psalm we can run to and we can read how David handled it. And so as we read the last half of the psalm, beginning in verse 16 down through the rest of the end of the psalm, we'll be seeing David turning to God and what he is trusting in in the midst of his betrayal. In your bulletin, you'll have those words. They'll also be on the screen if you want to read with me. I'll ask you to read where it says congregation in your bulletin. That's a different color. And I'll I'll read where it says pastor. And we'll read Psalm 55, verses 16 down through the end of the chapter. Let's begin in verse 16. As for me, I shall call upon God, and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon I will complain and murmur, and he will hear my voice. He will redeem my soul in peace from the battle which is against me, for they are many who strive with me. God will hear and answer them, even the one who sits enthroned from of old, Selah, with whom there is no change, and who do not fear God. He has put forth his hand against those who are at peace with him. He has violated his covenant. His speech is smoother than butter, but his heart was war. His words are softer than oil, but they're, yet they are drawn swords. Cast your burden upon the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. But you, O oh God, will bring them down to the pit of destruction. Men of bloodshed and deceit will not live out half their days, but I will trust in you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to run to you in the midst of betrayal and uncertainty. We thank you that you are a God who does not change, who sits of old enthroned above the earth, that nothing bothers you, moves you, changes you. We can be in the midst of chaos, and yet you are steady and secure. You are a rock in the midst of a storm, and on that rock we can have stability. When we run to you as our refuge in the middle of our uncertainty, our indecision, our confusion, So often we run to other things. We run to what our friends think. And we run to what we hear on the TV or the radio. Or we read on the internet. We run to the things that make us comfortable. And then affirm the things that we want to hear. Father, forgive us for running to anything but you. Give us wisdom. Give us the grace and the strength we need to run to you and trust in you and recognize that our life, the more mature we become, recognizes we don't need you less, we need you more. I pray that that would be the cry of our heart. Lord, we need you. Father, we thank you as a church that we get to support many people around the globe who are sharing your word with those around them. We thank you for a long partnership with Dale and Sandy Mayfield. And as they face health issues, as they grow older, 
and they're uh, interacting as the restrictions lift where they are. I pray that you would continue to give them ministry and grace as they continue to seek to serve you, even in their, even in their older years. We thank you for the legacy that they've left with their son, Kevin and Trina, and their grandson, Jeff and Lisa, as we're able to support both of them. And as Kevin and Trina work in Ecuador where there's, there's heavy restrictions and curfews and things that they're trying to work through, I pray that you'd give them wisdom as they seek to navigate those. We thank you that the application papers have been received for, for um, Trina's visa. I know it's not been a smooth process, and it's almost never been a smooth process for them. I pray that this one, as they apply and they get it uh, settled, that that would be a smooth process this time, and they'd be able to demonstrate their trust in you in the midst of it. Pray for Marco as he works alongside Kevin, as they seek to both share the gospel and disciple those who have made professions of faith, and as they're doing it in the midst of difficult restrictions, I pray that you would give them grace and strength to be able to demonstrate what it means to live a life that's founded on the rock in the midst of societal and cultural confusion and chaos. Father, we thank you for David Locke and Heather, his wife, and their, their boys. We thank you for the time that we spent with them and they spent with us here at Beth Eden. And now as they are ministering in Michigan at Cambria Baptist Church, we pray that you would give them wisdom and grace as they seek to lead well there. Father, they're opening up this week, regathering. They already have. And thank you uh, for the opportunity they have to do that. I pray that you would continue to give uh, uh, David wisdom as he seeks to lead his church wisely and graciously and in a godly manner through the, through the uh, reopening process there and through what life looks like for them uh, post all of this. Father, we thank you most of all for Christ. We thank you that we have a chance, as we've already sung today and will continue to sing, to be partakers of his work on the cross. That what he did on our behalf is incredible. What he did for us has brought us who were far away near to you. We thank you that because of his death, we can know you more. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, as we just read together in Scripture and as Randy just prayed, our God does not change and he remains faithful and his mercies are new every morning. So we'll sing that familiar hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Summer and winter and spring. 
There are lots of things that I appreciate about being back together, uh, not the least of which is just seeing smiley faces. Uh, but probably my favorite part is the fact that we were able to sing together again. Even if we, many of us are wearing masks, um, we, can, we can work through that. Please take your Bible and turn to Mark 15. Mark 15. For the past nine weeks, and I say nine weeks because we've had a few breaks along the way, uh, we have been journeying uh, with our Lord as He is headed down the long, dark road to the cross. And today, our journey comes to a very sobering end. When we conclude our service today and we say amen, Jesus will be on the cross. Following Jesus and the disciples' observance of Passover and the institution of the Lord's Supper, Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane where he sweat drops of blood in agony. While he was in the garden, Jesus was betrayed by Judas with a kiss, and then he was arrested. Jesus had promised, prophesied that the disciples would scatter, and they did just like he said they would. Overnight, from Thursday into Friday morning, Jesus endured two three-part sham trials. Last week, we referred to them as kangaroo courts. There was a religious trial by the Jewish leaders, and that was followed by a civil trial before Pilate, and then Herod, and then Pilate again. The Jewish leaders could convict Jesus of crimes, and they did that, although he had not actually committed the crimes that they convicted him of. But by law... They were not able to do what they wanted to do with him. Rome had to do that. They wanted him put to death. Pilate and Herod both found no fault in Jesus, but they didn't have the guts to stand against the will of the Jewish leaders in the crowd. In fact, quite the opposite. They viewed that as an opportunity to appease the Jewish people. So Pilate, although he had been warned by his wife, who had had a dream, he had been warned, don't have anything to do with, this right, with the conviction of this righteous man. He literally washed his hands in front of the assembled crowd as a symbol that was intended to distance himself from the death of an innocent man. Instead of releasing Jesus, a righteous man, at the wishes of the people, he, Pilate released Barabbas, Barabbas was a man who had been guilty, convicted of robbery and murder in the midst of an insurrection. When we left off last week, Jesus had been scourged, been stripped of his clothes, likely required to lean over a low pillar, had taken a short-handled whip that had leather straps attached to it, sharp objects embedded in the leather straps. And they had lashed him with the intent to lacerate and rip his skin. Roman law laid no limits on the number of times that they could whip him. And historians tell us that it was common for those that were being scourged to actually die while they were being scourged. According to the Gospel of John, What happens in our passage today is connected in that very same time frame as Jesus' scourging. Our passage describes the final hours of Jesus before his death, and it is a vivid illustration of what David described in Psalm 22, verses 16 to 18. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They look. They stare at me. 
They divide my garments among them. and For my clothing they cast lots. Today's message begins and ends with a cross-reference passage of Scripture and with the words of a Christian hymn. It just, just worked out that way. Last week, while we were observing the Lord's Supper as a church family, David had selected for us as one of the hymns for the week, Alleluia, what a Savior. In that hymn, we sing these words, Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. He sealed my pardon with his blood. Alleluia, what a Savior. And that fitly describes what we find in our passage this morning. So we'll read Mark 15, beginning in verse 16, and we'll read all the way down through verse 32. The soldiers took him away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and they called together the whole, whole Roman cohort. They dressed him up in purple after twisting a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to acclaim him, Hail, King of the Jews! They kept beating his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling and bowing before him. After they had mocked him, they took the purple robe off of him and put his own garments on him, and they led him out to crucify him. They pressed into service a passerby coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Then they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each man should take. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right, one on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says he was numbered with transgressors. Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha! You who are to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. We are not reading today all of the crucifixion narrative, but the portion that we read includes three separate scenes, and we'll simply move from one scene to the next this morning. The first scene is Jesus in custody at the praetorium. What was the praetorium? Well, it says in our passage that they took him into the palace, that is the praetorium, the palace or the hall. And this was the courtyard of the praetorium. Uh, the praetorium was either the governor's residence or at a place called Fort Antonia which was a military outpost in Jerusalem. Like I mentioned last week, this was also the headquarters of the local uh, Roman military. It says that they gathered the entire cohort, uh, that is the collection of soldiers, Roman soldiers. Uh, we became familiar with them a few weeks ago in Jesus' arrest, but here the entire group is gathered which would have been approximately 600 soldiers. So not only those that were there doing their work, holding Jesus in custody, but they sent word out. Remember, there were no cell phones. Uh, they sent word out, everybody gather. Everybody gather at the praetorium. Why are they gathering? They're gathering for a party, a planned party. And the feature of the party is the mockery of Jesus. I don't know exactly what that looked like, but I can imagine what it looked like. Uh, they were familiar with Jewish insurrections. 
They were familiar with putting them down. And they were familiar with the absurdity of so many of the leaders of those insurrections that thought that they would lift themselves up against Caesar. But this one, this insurrectionist, called himself the king of the Jews. It was called the king of the Jews. He didn't look anything like a king. So I can imagine that word went out amongst the cohort. He says he's the king of the Jews. Maybe some mocked sarcastic. He doesn't look like much of a king. Remember, by this time, Jesus has been spit upon, beaten, mocked. He's been beaten to the point where he's bruised, he's bloody, he's been scourged. He doesn't look anything like the king of the Jews. Why don't we make him look like a king? Maybe somebody said, so what do you put on a king? Maybe another one hollered, purple. You put on him purple. Maybe one of the soldiers had brought that day a cloak that maybe his wife had suggested that he wear because it had been chilly the night before. He says, here, take this. We'll put it on him. There, there, we have a king. And somebody else may have said, well, that's not all that a king wears. A king, a proper king should have a crown. Somebody looked over and there was a bush that had long thorns on it and they crafted it together into a, a crown of thorns. We don't know exactly what the plant was, uh, but for years and years and years here at our church property, our Sunday school teachers have simply gone out to the front of our property and we have a tree that has thorns on it. And they've simply cut out branches and some of them have shaped those branches into the shape of a crown. They drove it into his head. And the pain was great, but it was more than that. The purpose was to make a mockery of Jesus. And then maybe another soldier said, well, he's wearing purple and he's wearing a crown, which is fit for a king, but every, every king has a scepter, a symbol of his authority. And so they handed him a reed. You can imagine that they all kind of stepped back and said, and there we have it, a king. Maybe they did it like a toast, a king, a king to the king. Scripture says that they said, hail, king of the Jews, which is a variation of the customary and reverent address to Caesar. Ave, Caesar, victor, imperator, commander. Not only did they mock him, the Scripture says they abused him. They snatched the reed which had been given him in mockery as a king's scepter, and they beat him over the head with the reed. They spit on him. The king of kings has now been spit on repeatedly, different groups over long hours. They kneeled before him and bowed before him in complete mockery. And with the final words of verse 20, we signal the end of the preliminaries before Jesus' crucifixion. The betrayal is done. The arrest is done. The quote-unquote trials are over. He has been held in custody. The time has come to take him to the cross. So the second scene is only one verse long in Mark. That is the journey to the cross, Jesus carrying the cross to, the, to Golgotha. This was a normal thing. Condemned prisoners were often called on to carry the cross beam of their cross to their execution site. You can imagine that after this method of death had been created, invented, after a few times of soldiers carrying the cross beam, one of the soldiers may have said, why are we doing this? He's the criminal. He should carry it. So by this time, that had become tradition. Not only did they have the criminal carry his cross beam, but they intentionally brought him through the streets of Jerusalem. Why is that? Why is that? I think it was a kind of intimidation. 
intimidation. When I was an undergraduate student in college, uh, I was taking a class called Pulpit Speech. And uh, the first semester of the class, we had a very patient professor. In our class, we would, uh, they would teach us a, form, a, a kind of sermon, and then three times each semester, everybody in the class would preach that kind of sermon. And the first semester, my professor was really affirming. He'd sit in the back of the room and nod his head. So even if you weren't doing very well, oh, it's wonderful. He was really encouraging. Second semester, uh, the professor was not quite so affirming. And um, after our first unit, we were all going to preach through that kind of sermon. And the guy that went ahead of me preached, and boy, the sermons were only, if I remember, 8 to 15 minutes long. They weren't that long. And uh, you say, wow, I, I wish that we would continue in that pattern. Uh, but he, uh, he, this guy in front of me preached, and uh, boy, he preached quite passionately. And uh, he sat down after he was finished. It was time for the pulpit speech teacher to provide an evaluation. And the teacher said, well, you gestured in all the right places. And you raised your voice in all the right times, and you lowered your voice at all the right times, and you maintained good eye contact. And you could see as this guy is just really taking this all in, being encouraged. But then the teacher paused and he said, but you missed the entire point of the passage. Whoa. I remember watching and thinking, I never want to be in that position. I don't ever want to be in the position where somebody says, you, 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 you had all the right motions in all the right places, but you completely missed the point of the passage. In a strange kind of way, that's exactly what's happening here. As children and teenagers would watch as criminals would carry their crossbeam through the streets of Jerusalem, every one of them would think, I never want to be in that position. It was kind of a simple fulfillment of what Proverbs says, smite a scorner, and the simple will beware. But the scripture says in verse 21, it doesn't say much about Jesus carrying the cross beam, but rather it says that it was handed off, that he needed assistance. I don't ever hide the fact that I begin my sermon preparation by reading um, uh, uh, study Bibles. And there's a very simple note in the MacArthur Study Bible that says this, Exhausted from a sleepless night and severely wounded and weakened by scourging, Jesus was unable to continue. The Roman guards conscripted Simon, apparently at random, to carry Jesus' crossbeam the rest of the way. Simon, who was from northern Africa, city of Cyrene, was on his way to Jerusalem. Which brings us to the third scene. The scene that we've been moving towards for the last few months. The location was Golgotha. The exact location is disputed. Uh, they suggest two spots um, in and around Jerusalem. The name of the location, however, is provided for us. Golgotha, a place of a skull or a skull. The name was almost definitely a reference to the shape of the hill, a rounded, bare cliff. This place has also become known to us as Christians as Calvary. Why is that? Well, that name comes from the Latin word Calvaria, which is an elaboration of the word Calva, which means skull. What took place there? What took place there? According to Mark, they offered him wine mixed with myrrh. Uh, this is a tradition that had grown up and, and was often practiced by Jewish people and possibly in fulfillment with what we find in Proverbs 31, verses 6 and 7. Give strong drink to him who is perishing and wine to those in bitter distress. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. The, the wine and the myrrh mix was a kind of anesthetic cocktail. It was designed to ease the edges of the pain, take a little bit of the edge off. It says in only four words in the New American Standard, beginning of verse 24, three words in the original language, and they crucified him. What did that look like? 
Well, I'd like to read from one commentator, William Lane is his name. And I'm going to read and paraphrase some. If it sounds really good and clean, it's probably I'm reading. If it's not quite as clear, I may be paraphrasing. He said this, Normally the delinquent was stripped, and after having been scourged, his outstretched arms were nailed or tied with cords to the crossbeam, which he himself had been forced to carry to the place of execution. The cross piece was then lifted up with the body on it and fastened to an upright stake already sunk into the earth to which the feet were now nailed. The cross was thus formed by the upright and traverse beam. A block of wood fixed about midway up the post supported the body. While the use of nails to fasten a body to the cross is not widely attested, in June of 1968, a team of Israeli scholars discovered in northeastern Jerusalem a Jewish tomb which produced the first authenticated evidence of a crucifixion in antiquity. Among the remains in an ossuary were those of an individual whose lower calf bones had been broken and whose heel bones had been uh, nailed fixed with a single iron nail. Detailed study of the find showed that the feet of the victim had been nailed together between a cross of olive wood and another kind of wood with a 17 to 18 centimeter iron nail, which when it had been driven through, hit a knot in the wood and bent in the process. The archaeologist said this, The feet were joined almost parallel, both transfixed by the same nails at the heels, with the legs adjacent. The knees were doubled the right of one overlapping the left, the trunk was contorted. The upper limbs were stretched out, each stabbed by a nail in the forearm. The height of the cross varied. Most crosses were only slightly taller than the one who was being crucified on the cross. But in some cases where they wanted to make a point of the criminal who was being crucified, they would raise the cross up. Jesus' cross was raised. We know that because they had to use a reed. To, uh, the soldiers used a reed to offer him what they offer him in the next passage. And that the mockery included calling him down off of the cross. He concludes by saying this. Crucifixion was essentially death by exhaustion. The time required for death naturally depended on the physical condition of the victim as well as the manner by which the body was affixed to the cross. When nails were used, physical torment was heightened. But ordinarily, it was less protracted because death was hastened by the loss of blood. When men had tied to, were tied to the cross, they sometimes remained alive for days. Yet the weight of the body hanging on the cross frequently caused such a state of exhaustion that the death occurred in a matter of several hours. And so, as Mark says, and they crucified him. As Jesus was going to the cross, he carried a plaque that was normal. Uh, The plaque, again, kind of with that idea of intimidation, wanting to make a point to those that would see as the one who was being crucified was being led through Jerusalem. Uh, The the plaque made a point of saying what that person was convicted for or convicted of. Jesus' plaque said, King of the Jews. The wording was intended to be a kind of preemptive strike against the Jews. You think that you can raise somebody up that would stand against Caesar? Well, here's your king. It was intended as mockery of Jesus as well. But the wording is significant to us as Christians. Although it was intended to be mockery of Jesus and a kind of not-so-subtle warning to the Jews, it's confirmation of what we have been reading from the very beginning of Mark's gospel. And what is that? That Jesus is the Messiah. He is the long-promised, anointed one. What it was intended as mockery actually spoke the truth. Scripture says that the soldiers played a game for Jesus' clothes. If the clothes were valuable by the one that was um, convicted and crucified, then it became a kind of plunder for the soldiers. 
But if it was not valuable, in that way it was just kind of a token of the prize of their having participated in that crucifixion. A kind of morbid, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. It happened exactly like Psalm 22:18 suggested. They played a game to decide who would get what. The crowd mocks Jesus. Their mocking was accompanied by wagging of their heads. Just like you do when you see something absurd or ridiculous or embarrassing and you shake your head. Mm, 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 mm. They shouted, Ha! You are who destroy the temple. Rebuild in three days. You can imagine that the Jewish leaders had spread that word. This is what he said. This is what he said. And now they're mocking him because he's bruised and beaten and has, has been scourged and is barely recognizable. You? You're going to tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days? Of course, he was referring to his own body. Come down from the cross, they say. Jewish leaders continued with their mockery. And then our passage ends this morning with even the robbers jumping in. They also were insulting him. As I was studying this last week, it's been my heart that this not be simply a kind of information dump pertaining to the crucifixion narrative. Many of these details we are already familiar with. But maybe what I couldn't have expected in just pouring over this passage again and again is the rich, treasured applications that are found in it. I found five. Number one, Jesus never lost control. Jesus never lost control. I don't necessarily mean that he did not lose his temper or become sinfully angry, although that is certainly true. He was the perfect, sinless Son of God. And I, I, I watch in amazement, read in amazement as you do, that he was able to uh, maintain a sinless response. But I don't know about you, when I, when I read the Scripture in sermon preparation, um, I read and I simply jot down everything that is of interest to me, anything that I just want to note. The next time through I read and I, I simply ask questions. Uh, what does this mean? Why is this here? And one of the questions that came up every time I read the passage is, why didn't Jesus accept the wine and myrrh? Why is that? If, all of, if, if the reason that it was given was designed to take the edge off of the pain and make it just a little less excruciating, why wouldn't he accept that? Well, I think there are some important answers to that question. I think it's important for us to be reminded the king, the sovereign king, is working everything to the planned and necessary end. Jesus is in full control. Uh, we noted last week from John 10 that Jesus did not, his life was not taken from him, but he gave it up. All of this is working to a, a desired and planned end. I think it's interesting that in all of the paragraphs of our passage today, except for the short paragraph that describes the transfer of the crossbeam, every other passage notes the fact, notes the mockery. Every other paragraph notes mockery. Every other paragraph notes a reference to Jesus as king of the Jews. And what is the most critical part of being a king? It is sovereignty. Soul, leadership, and control. Jesus never loses control in the midst of all of this. But we also would note this, that everything Jesus says and does on the cross is with his full faculties about him. He is not under the influence of anesthetic. And so the sayings that are so dear to us, every part of this is, is as Jesus intended. Second, Jesus drank all of the cup of God's wrath, all of it. You remember just a few chapters ago when James and John had asked Jesus if they can, and their mom, Salome, had asked Jesus if they could sit at his right hand and his left in the, in the kingdom. And Jesus says, that's not mine to give. And he says, anyway, 
would you be able to drink of the cup that I'm going to drink? And of course, he was referring to the cup of God's wrath, and eventually they would. Jesus drank all of that cup, no shortcuts, such that when Paul writes in Romans 4 regarding the resurrection, he says Jesus was raised for our justification. You say, Pastor Jason, what does that have to do with anything? When Jesus was raised, it was evidence that God had accepted Jesus' payment for our sin. There were no shortcuts. He drank all of that cup. So that just like we sang last week when we sang the power of the cross, took the blame, bore the wrath, we stand forgiven at the cross. Third, already mentioned that it says, and they crucified him. That's all it says in Mark. But if you compare Mark with Matthew, uh, with Matthew, Luke, and John, you find that that's typical of the gospel writers. Why is that? Hebert says this, stating the horrible fact in the most simple words, all of the Gospels state the historical fact, but none has a single word of description of the physical agonies involved. None of them do. You say, Pastor Jason, why did we read it all this morning then? Why did, you, why did you explain what a commentator said when it's not in the passage? Because one of the reasons why I think it's, it's not included in, by the Gospel writers is I think it was understood by the readers. I don't know about you, I've never actually seen a crucifixion. And so it's helpful for me to know more about it. But most of the people had already seen it. He says, is that the only reason you think? I think it's more than that. The Scripture does not tend to unnecessarily expound on that which is wicked or gross or unseemly. But furthermore, the focus of the Scripture in regards to Jesus' crucifixion is not the physical nature of it, but the purpose of it. Which brings us to our fourth point. The mocking words of the Jewish leaders was, Jesus did not save himself. You saved others, but you could not save yourself. Why is that? Jesus did not save himself so that he could save others. The crowd and the Jewish leaders would actually be proclaiming the gospel if they changed one word. You didn't save yourself. You saved others, but you couldn't save yourself. They would be proclaiming the gospel if they said this, you, sa you saved others, but you didn't save yourself. Why did he not save himself? So that he could save you and me. That's substitution. That's the heart of the gospel. That's greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And we see that very same gospel at work in this moment. So finally, some who were present actually believed. Some who were present actually believed. As I'm reading this passage, uh, you may have asked the exact same question I asked. You get to verse 21, and it says that the, the cross beam was handed off to Simon of Cyrene, but then in parentheses, which is found in the original manuscripts, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Why would Mark include that? Why is that? Well, the reason why, likely, is because the readers were familiar, those who would have read Mark's gospel, will, were familiar with Rufus and Alexander. And Mark wanted them to know that this Simon that carried Jesus' crossbeam was the father of this, these, these men that you know, Rufus and Alexander. So well, what's the point of that? Well, in Romans, Paul is writing to the Roman believers, and he's writing... Uh, the, the Gospel of Mark was written in Rome. And as he writes, he says this. He concludes his, 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 uh, his letter. Greet Rufus, a choice man in the Lord. Rufus was a believer. And I don't think it's a stretch for us to, to conclude that Rufus, who was the son of Simon may have very well first heard the gospel from his father Simon, who first was exposed to the gospel while watching Jesus die on the cross that Simon had carried. Second, there's a robber. I mentioned that our passage today ends in, in verse 32, where it says those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. But that's not the end of the story. 
the story ends, as Paul Harvey would say, there's the rest of the story. And that's not included in Mark's gospel, but it is included in Luke's gospel, so I'll just read it. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other one, and this is presumably later after he had already been insulting Jesus, rebuked him, who's that, the other criminal, and said, Do you not even fear God? Whoa! Something's going on in this man's heart. Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And how does Jesus respond? No, you've been too wicked. No, it's too late for you. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And we just note it's significant that Jesus didn't take the wine and myrrh. This was not being said under some kind of misunderstanding because of an anesthetic fog. He was speaking to this man the truth. This man had become a believer. The point I'm trying to make for now, for right now, that's a sermon in and of itself, is that even in this moment, the kingdom is growing. And there's actually another one that's recorded in Scripture, but I don't want to take that away from next week's passage. In the darkest hour ever, when it looked like all hope was lost, when Jesus' disciples had scattered, God was still building His kingdom. What do we do with this passage? How do we walk away? Well, if we're believers, uh, I want to just simply read a passage and then one verse of him and we'll be done. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15 says, For the love of Christ controls us, controls us. Having thus concluded that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. What unfolds in the remainder of the New Testament is an instruction about how to live as one who has been rescued by Jesus' uh, provided salvation. The gospel not only saves us eternally, but it transforms us now so that we can say, I am less and less living for myself and more and more living for God and his people. Or as the words of When I Survey the Wondrous Cross says, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Let's pray that we will not only be cross-centered, gospel-centered, Christ-centered people on Sunday morning, but on Monday afternoon and on Wednesday evening, and before we go to bed on Friday, and at work every day, in all of our conversations. Our theme for the year is first things first, and our emphasis for two months is partnering even better. One of the things that has been emphasized again and again and again by Pastor Don Hall, who had served as our missions pastor and by our missions committee and our other pastors is, and even by our missionaries as they come back and visit with us, is the reminder that we are to, we, it is not enough to partner with our missionaries to fulfill the Great Commission in other places, but it's our responsibility to fulfill the Great Commission here. So as we conclude our service, we're going to sing two verses of facing a task unfinished. And we're going to sing verses of, a, of that kind of song for the remainder, to conclude our service for the remainder of June and July. as just a simple reminder that we are to take this gospel. And as Paul said in Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. And so we want to not only understand this gospel and embrace it, but to share it with those that God puts in our way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us today. 
how we needed to be reminded of the price that was paid for our rescue from our sin and the punishment for our sin. Lord, we need to be reminded that you are still building your kingdom, that there are others who are hearing and believing this gospel, and it's our joyful privilege to be a part of sharing the gospel. And we needed to be reminded that this salvation is not just a future salvation where we'll be rescued from eternal punishment, but it's a, it's a transforming gospel that changes our life now as the power of sin is broken over us and as we progressively become more like Christ. I pray that the power of the gospel would be seen in each one of us each day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's people together said, Amen. Amen. You'll find in your bulletin the hymn Facing a Task Unfinished and our response to the gospel we just heard preached we just prayed about is to go to all the world, including our daily lives this week, with kingdom hope unfurled because no other name has power to save. But Jesus Christ the Lord. We'll sing verses 1 and 2 and then the refrain of Facing a Task Unfinished. Facing a task unfinished that drives us to our knees, a need that undiminished rebukes our softful ease. We who rejoice to Thy truth, a mighty sword. Thy truth, a mighty sword. 